I'm Roy Lee Lindsay with the North Carolina Pork Council, and I want everyone to remember, bacon makes everything better. Mike Waddell along with David Glenn on this special report from the North Carolina Sports Network on today's big news, Florida State filing a lawsuit against the ACC. And on Thursday, the precursor to that, the ACC filing a lawsuit against Florida State. Now, on August 4th, we did a special report on FSU making noise about leaving the ACC. Since that date, we've had another football season that has come and gone. The Seminoles went 13-0, but they're not in the CFP. We've heard that nonstop over the last month. Now, Florida State has been blaming the College Football Playoff Committee, its chair, NC State AD, Boo Corrigan, whose father, Gene Corrigan, welcomed the Seminoles to the ACC back in 1992. And Florida's governor, their U.S. senator, both have spoken out publicly on the CFP snub. Attorney General Moody's antitrust division is sending a civil investigative demand to the committee for more information about that. But today, it's not about the CFP. It's about that bigger issue that Michael offered and the board chair and the president at Florida State were talking about back in August. What prompted Florida State, David Glenn, to make this move the Friday before Christmas? Well, it's good to be with you again, Mike, as always. And I will answer that question, which is a good one. But make sure we get back to some of those politicians who are trying to sink their teeth into the college football playoff controversy. Everybody knows that I think Florida State should have been in. And a lot of coaches, more importantly, believe that any Power 5 team that goes 13 and O and wins its conference should also be in. So there's a, a whole nother debate about that. Uh, I believe most of the political stuff is performance art, you know, political theater, hoping that gullible, naive, uneducated, uninformed people will see somebody going to bat for the Seminoles and vote for them rather than having a better understanding of how such things work legally and otherwise, which I do as a guy who's been an attorney since 1994, uh, I can promise you the college football playoff committee is not going to lose a lawsuit over putting one team over another when one of their listed criteria is that they can consider a missing star player. I mean, it, you can say it's an unfair result, and I agree with you, but anybody saying they might win the lawsuit here – if you're not sure who the mark is and you don't understand the concepts in play, guess what? You're the mark. They think you're gullible. They think you're naive. And they think you'll vote for them just because they're taking a big whack at the pinata on behalf of maybe your favorite school. Don't be a fool. Educate yourself about how these things work. And you won't be played the way those politicians are trying to play you right now. But back to your question, Mike. What prompted FSU to make this move on the Friday before Christmas? Obviously, only they know all the variables. It is no surprise that Florida State is going in this direction in the general sense, but I think the exact timing did surprise a lot of people. While not everyone uh, at FSU is of the same mindset, obviously, right? Lots of different people, some more aggressive, some not as aggressive. I can tell you with certainty that the combination of three factors moved the Seminoles' timetable forward pretty quickly, meaning to that Friday before Christmas. Number one, the media rights gap between the mighty Big Ten and the mighty SEC, and not only the ACC, remember, but also the Big 12. Right now, it's large but manageable. The same gap is going to be in the $40 million a year range by the 2025-2026 season. So what's manageable now, nobody likes falling behind financially, but what's manageable now, a smaller number, becomes a $40 million a year number by 2025-26, and eventually even a $50 million a year. And that's per school per year, the amount of the check that you get from the conference office in the Big Ten and the SEC, soon to be $40 million a year more than what the ACC schools get from the Atlantic Coast Conference office once a year, and eventually $50 million a year, gradually even more than that. That's number one. But that's been in play for a while. The other two 
The Seminoles got left out of the CFP, as you noted, which had a lot of people hopping mad. And anybody doesn't think that emotions play some part in this uh, hasn't followed human nature for very long. Number three, Florida state officials, some of them, did not see ACC Commissioner Jim Phillips publicly advocating for the Seminoles leading up to the playoff committee's decision to the same degree that we've seen Greg Sankey advocate publicly for the Southeastern Conference, uh, the commissioner of the SEC, of course, or even one of its teams in various settings or contexts. Remember Jim Delaney, former commissioner of the Big Ten? All sorts of examples where he was loudly and proudly and publicly advocating on some issue for the Big Ten as a league or one of its member schools in a committee vote situation, football or basketball or something else. Notre Dame's various athletic directors at different times have chosen to be very public and very adamant advocating for the Fighting Irish. Jim Phillips did not do that to the satisfaction of Florida State officials. So if you add together the growing financial gap left out of the college football playoff and what they saw as a mostly invisible Jim Phillips when they needed him most, those three things combined to move up the timetable. And I think those angry folks at FSU, you know how this works, man. You're a former Division I athletic director. If some of the decision makers are angrier, maybe they'll move it up. And if some of the boosters who might help bankroll these lawsuits, which are expensive and probably will take a while, if some of those boosters, when angry, are more willing to reach into their pockets, absolutely that can tr contribute to moving the timetable up as it did this time. So what's the end game for Florida State in all of this? We have two lawsuits, one filed in Florida, one filed in North Carolina. We won't get into that. But what's the end game here? Are they looking to just be free or are they perhaps already weighing offers to go to either the Big Ten, the SEC, or the Big 12? I mean, it's just crazy how this stuff is all flowing together. But again, what's the end game for Florida State and their director of athletics, Michael Offord? Well, everyone can see that the dream scenario from Florida State's point of view is to A, leave as soon as possible, and B, have a zero penalty. That is extremely, extremely unlikely to happen, especially anytime soon. So any talking head or pundit or writer or politician telling you that that is a likely scenario is lying to you. Do not let them lie to you without penalty. Stop listening to those people. They've been steering you in the wrong direction for more than a decade on this issue at this point. A less obvious secondary goal for the Florida State Seminoles, as I see it, is to get closer to what many in the legal world call cost certainty. That means even if you don't win your lawsuit, I'll put it first. Let's say you win, maybe not on every count, but let's say you have a legal pleasant surprise and at least some combination of the $130 million exit fee and the loss of your media rights through 2036, which remember Florida State's own attorneys just estimated earlier today that the combined cost, exit fee plus loss of media rights value, they estimated that the combined cost is more than half a billion dollars. Reminder, that means you know between 500 and 600 million dollars. That's a pretty pretty uh, big number even by modern college sports standards. If you win part of your lawsuit, that number goes down. But even if you lose your lawsuit, keep in mind this. As long as Florida State has this massive legal issue, the grant of rights, which remember has never been challenged by a major university, which means, of course, it's never been successfully challenged. Texas and Oklahoma are wealthy universities that could have challenged the grant of rights when they wanted to leave the Big 12 for the SEC a little bit earlier. Guess what? They didn't. Their lawyers told them they were probably going to lose, which was good advice. So they stayed in the Big 12 longer. They minimized the size of their exit fee. How? Not by suing the Big 12, but by waiting until closer to the end of the grant of rights to finally jump to the SEC at a lower cost. If Florida State gets cost certainty, the Big 10, which obviously is intrigued by Florida State, great football brand. Lots of people watch the Seminoles football games. No doubt about it. It would be new geography 
for the Big Ten. It's not mere coincidence that when the Big Ten adds schools, it's almost always in a new state where they don't already have a member. I mean, heck, they did it with Rutgers in Maryland just to get in new parts of the country, new TV eyeballs, more Big Ten network subscribers, more overall TV viewers. And now they're obviously headed to California in the form of UCLA and Southern Cal, but also the Northwest with the additions gradually of Oregon and Washington on top of it. Florida State is a compelling candidate for the Big Ten. However, the Big Ten is not going to hold serious talks with the Seminoles as long as this legal black cloud is hanging over them. I mean, the, the loss of your media rights all the way through 2036 is not a small issue. That's a massive issue. And to whatever degree back channel communications are happening between Florida State and the Big Ten, I promise you, because I've heard it from Big Ten athletic directors themselves, we're not messing with Florida State until they get their situation with the ACC resolved. So think about it, Mike. Even if Florida State loses the lawsuit, again, there, there might be a it, – it's not always the ACC wins on all counts or the Florida State wins on all counts. Lawsuits are not always uh, ending that way, right? There can be some kind of negotiation down from that $500 million plus after a judge gets a look at this case and starts to tell both sides, you know, which, which is on the firmer legal footing, which I believe to be the Atlantic Coast Conference. And I believe Florida State's attorneys are aware of that at all. But think about how FSU would benefit, even if they know they're on the shakier legal ground, which again, I think they are, they would have more certainty. They would have a judge advising the ACC attorneys and the FSU attorneys to maybe negotiate a number less than the maximum amount that would allow the Seminoles to leave at some point between now and obviously 2036. There's an advantage to moving this football forward in the legal system, even if the Seminoles know that they are absolutely unlikely to win on all counts. And I think they have an uphill battle on most counts. Uh, remember, there's a lot at stake here. And Florida State, in its eyes, would be losing a lot of money just to, just to twiddle its thumbs and stay in the ACC. They don't want to fall further behind financially the way I described earlier with that growing gap. So they see this as a calculated risk that even if they can't win on all the legal counts, they can get closer to knowing with more certainty exactly what kind of penalty they're dealing with and, and a better idea of what kind of timetable they may be dealing with as well. Right now, the Florida State meteorites are owned by the ACC and ESPN. The Big Ten has a deal with CBS and Fox. And then a little bit of NBC moved in there. And the Big 12 has some stuff with Fox. So the question would be, why would ESPN, who is one of the monoliths of college athletics right now in the control, why would they bid against themselves and in any way welcome Florida State to a league that they also control, the SEC, if they're going to have to pay money for them because they already have them? Yeah, I think there's a couple hurdles with the Florida State to the SEC scenario. Number one, we all know the Florida Gators, and I mean it's personal in many cases, hate the Florida State Seminoles. So Florida is not the only vote on SEC expansion, but we all know the Gators are going to vote no, and we all know that the Gators would throw their weight around to try to get as many others to vote no on, SC, on the SEC inviting the Seminoles. The only two obviously wealthy places they can go, the Seminoles, are the Big Ten and the SEC. Some people throw out the Big 12, but you know what? The Big 12, especially in the process of losing Oklahoma and Texas, the Big 12, as it's currently uh, consisting, is not a better football product than the Atlantic Coast Conference. And the Big 12's per school payout is only a little bit better than the ACC's. So if Florida State wants into the Big Ten or the SEC, and for geography reasons, for Florida Gators reasons, and for ESPN reasons, I think the SEC invitation is infinitely less likely to come the Seminoles' way. Again, the SEC, like the Big Ten, wants the Seminoles to deal with this legal stuff before they would even seriously consider an invitation. But I think the more likely offer would come from the Big Ten at some point down the road when Florida State cleans up this this legal mess. So your logic is right on the SEC, um, but of course the Big Ten does not have that same hurdle. They see 
Florida State's right about one thing, whether some fans in the ACC want to hear it or not. They're getting roughly one fourteenth of the media money, and really the, the overall ACC payout has been mostly equal among member schools for its entire 70-plus year existence. But Florida State can show with absolute certainty that it is creating a lot more value than the one fourteenth slice of the pie that the Seminoles get every year. Now, that's not a legal argument, by the way. You, you, you can't say, I signed it. I signed an agreement where I knew my school got one fourteenth, but now I'm unhappy because more people are watching our games. You don't win a lawsuit because of that. You signed the deal. You got to live with the deal that you signed. Uh, but from the Big Ten's perspective, they know that the Florida State Seminoles are undoubtedly the ACC's strongest football brand. So the combination of that brand and those TV eyeballs and the new state of Florida, which of course is one of the three most populous states in the United States, it's not just any state, that would be a new state for the Big Ten. And then that league, while already the wealthiest in America, would be stretched all the way from California through the Midwest down into Florida. And remember, the Big Ten, Mike, is rarely has more than one school in the same state. That's not an accident. That's by design. And the Big Ten doesn't have many private universities. That's not an accident. That's by design. The SEC and the Big Ten models are about spreading out geographically, finding football TV eyeballs in terms of good football programs, of course, but also passionate fan bases. And there are more of those football crazy fan bases in the Big Ten and the SEC than there are in the ACC. So I, I agree with your premise. The SEC inviting Florida State is a lower likelihood than the Big Ten inviting Florida State. But again, neither of those two leagues is going to invite the Seminoles until they clean up this legal mess. He's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell. This is a North Carolina Sports Network special report on the Florida State against the ACC and the ACC against Florida State lawsuits that have been filed in North Carolina and in Florida over the last 48 hours. So, David, let's go back a couple weeks ago when new NCAA uh, chief Charlie Baker put forth a proposition. It was talking about a new tier of football to where kids could be paid. And that's where it seems like to me where the money really starts to come to pass. And we talked about that several times over the course of the football season, because if schools can all of a sudden create a payroll, now that gulf of money really means more than just building another building or adding on to a stadium. My point is, you talk about the SEC and the Big Ten being more national conferences now. If that's the case, and Charlie Baker's thing comes to pass, and it really is a whole new tier of football, why do conferences even matter? Because at the end of the day, it's still going to be ESPN, Fox, NBC, and CBS, and, and of course the CW, bidding in on this massive college football new structure and championship format. There might come a point where, for the purposes of football, conferences don't matter. I enjoyed uh, Chip Kelly's recent rant on this exact topic. i just like to remind people, though, for that new world to happen anytime soon, there is no magic wand that makes that happen. Even if everybody agreed it was a good idea, there are a whole lot of people that would have to agree to make it happen on a short timetable. And here's what I mean. ESPN has a deal written all the way through 2036 with the ACC. Does the ESPN, is ESPN willing to tear up that contract for a seat at the table on what this you know, no conference 60 plus team mega league would be. I don't know. Uh, the, the Fox folks um, the and the NBC folks, they have well into the future signed TV deals with their various partners. Are they willing to rip up those contracts just for a seat at the table where they're not sure what they're going to get from this big 60 plus team monstrosity? And then you have to decide, well, which schools are going to be in this 60-plus team monstrosity? How do you decide who gets invited? College football doesn't have a commissioner. The NCAA president is not in position to wave this magic wand. There has to be a universally respected individual who knows and has the respect of TV partners, knows and has the respect of university presidents, knows and has the respect of athletic directors, and can build a consensus of some sort even if that person was found, and even if a college football commissioner was created, it would take years 
at you know to 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 pull that kind of thing together. At the very least, I think we're going to play out the existing deal uh, for the new 12-team college football playoff. Down the road, could we have what you just described? I, I do think we could have it. Just like, but but just like Florida State's not leaving the ACC in the near term, this is going to take a while to play out. That new world you just described is not happening in the near term either. At least we don't think so, because you never know in this day and age. I mean, it is such a scramble board right now, and lots of different people are going on shows and on social media, and they have opinions. The talking heads, what are they getting right right now? And more importantly, for the folks out there who seek out learned counsel on things like this from you, the North Carolina Sports Network's gen general counsel, where are they going wrong? Well, they're right about this is a, th a throwing down of the gauntlet by Florida State. FSU has decided to be antagonistic about this publicly and otherwise. They have alienated some of their ACC colleagues. They don't seem to care. UNC's Bubba Cunningham was among the few folks who publicly said, all right, quiet down. If you want to leave, leave. If you want to file a lawsuit, file a lawsuit. But enough of the of the unhelpful chatter, right? You know, many others feel the way Bubba Cunningham feel about those months worth of negativity emanating from Tallahassee, but few have said it publicly. I'd say more than a dozen have said it privately to me personally, and I, know, I don't know everybody, so I'm sure the list is much longer than that. Th this is a pivotal moment in ACC history. So nobody is overstating the importance of these back-to-back uh, -back lawsuits. I think most people are also getting right the value of the uh, Seminoles in the ACC. FSU's general argument, as I mentioned earlier, about how they're providing more value to the Atlantic Coast Conference than they're getting out of the league with that 114th share. Notre Dame gets that partial share as a non-football member. The Seminoles' philosophical argument on that point is absolutely right. I mean, I hear some fans saying, well, it's only last year and this year that you're even any good in football and you were horrible for a while. None of that matters. FSU fans watch these games in huge numbers, even when the Seminoles are bad. And if you broke down, I think it was when you break down this past year, I'd have to double check this number exactly. But of the 10 Conference games, I don't mean when an ACC team plays a non-conference opponent. I mean when it's ACC versus ACC. There were 10 games this year during the regular season where the ACC football broadcast, again, only conference games, got more than 2 million viewers. Seven of the 10 involved the Florida State Seminoles. So they're right with that part of their argument, even though I think their legal arguments – are largely long shots or uphill battles. Not that I blame them for trying to make those arguments. I just think if they're smart attorneys, which they probably are, they realize they're not negotiating from a position of strength. But what the talking heads and a lot of fans are getting wrong right now is a long list. I'll give you try I'll try to be brief with three things. One, it's what I mentioned earlier. The idea that the Seminoles are leaving the ACC in the near future, meaning like the, the next year and a half, let's say fundamentally ridiculous. Lawsuits take time, especially lawsuits of this sort, which are large in terms of the money involved, but also they're cases of uh, without precedent. I mean, there are other antitrust lawsuits, of course, but no college has ever challenged one of these grants of, grants of rights. So this is a new case in that regard. New cases take longer, generally speaking, than when you're revisiting a, an issue that's been hashed and rehashed over and over in the courts. Keep in mind, as far back as 2013, some of the talking heads that people are listening to right now, a decade ago, were saying that either Florida State and Clemson were about to imminently leave the ACC or the ACC was, quote, about to fall apart. You can find these tweets on Twitter. These people aren't even smart enough to delete the imbecilic, uninformed things that they said a decade ago. Now, eventually, the blind squirrel finds the nut, Mike. I mean, the broken clock is right two times a day, right? So these con artist grifters who just want attention and, and want you to believe they know what they're talking about but don't, just please keep in mind that 11 years running, they've been wrong repeatedly on these issues, and they're doing it again. Number two, the idea that if Florida State finds one friendly judge in Florida, 
and that that one friendly judge in the Sunshine State rules in the Seminoles' favor on the grant of rights or the exit fee or some combination. And, and there is a chance that what I just described could happen from one friendly judge in Florida. But the idea that somehow the case is over at that point, anybody who tells you that is simply clueless and is grifting you, conning you, take advantage of you, hoping that you're naive and gullible and click on their website and, and watch their YouTube channel. They don't know what they're talking about. Again, it's just it just doesn't work that way. Any attorney who has worked in the court system specifically would tell you that's not how the legal process works. There Things take time. There are appeals. There are even jurisdiction battles. You mentioned, Mike, the ACC filed its lawsuit in North Carolina. The Seminoles filed their lawsuit in Florida. Well, guess what? It's going to take a while for that to hash out. They're going to argue over the, prop, the uh, most appropriate venue. It, it is not assumption, bottom line, it is not a smart assumption, and smart people don't make it, to believe that any first decision from any judge anywhere on this case is automatically the end of the case. Again, it just does not work that way. If anybody tells you it does, stop watching or listening to that person. They're clueless or grifting you. Finally, whereas some of this analysis requires knowledge of the finances of this stuff we've been describing, which at this point, I believe there are a lot of fans, Mike, who have embraced and digested the, the financial aspects of this, whether it's because of our work at the North Carolina Sports, work, uh, Sports Network, but also... I mean, there's a lot of really good sports journalists out there, and I don't use the word journalists uh, easily. Uh, the people that I respect at ESPN or The Athletic or CBS Sports or some good work at Yahoo Sports or Brett McMurphy, for example. And these people are believable. They're really good at their jobs, and they've done a good job of outlining the financial aspects of this stuff in the professionally run sports media outlets out there like the North Carolina Sports Network, but of course also others. Most of those same journalists, with all due respect, they just don't have the legal expertise required to understand this next chapter of this case. Now, as an attorney myself for almost 30 years now, I can't tell you today how this case is going to end. Any responsible attorney would not promise you a result. Literally, even those hired by Florida State University, hired by the ACC, they're not even allowed to promise a result according to the professional, the rules of professional responsibility. But even if they were allowed, they shouldn't do it and they wouldn't do it because there are enough legal arguments to be made in both directions. I can tell you that Florida State's legal arguments involving, for example, the concept of bad faith or the concept of, quote, fiduciary mismanagement, those sorts of legal arguments, Mike, are a lot harder to win than the talking heads have suggested in some cases, and that a lot of fans out there are assuming to be the case. Those terms have legal definitions that make them hard to prove. And I'm not sure most fans understand that, and I've already seen that a lot of the pundits definitely don't get it. They certainly don't. And it seems like right now, and this is just one person's opinion, my own, but Florida State enters into a playoff scenario just like everybody else at the Football Bowl subdivision. The rules are clearly stated, okay? And yet they want to file a lawsuit about discovery, as you have already said. Those are going nowhere. Brian Kelly, a coach that I helped hire at the University of Cincinnati years ago, now the head coach at LSU, I think had one of the best explanations of why this went through. He said, well, you have five power conferences. At one point, you, you had, you know, you know, the Pac-12. But you have five power conferences and only four places to go. Of course, there was a problem. The issue was in February of 2022 when the Big 12 and the Pac-12 and the ACC, their leadership voted not to expand. Now, with the conference grant of rights, this is a contract that Florida State leadership has signed not once, not twice, but three times. OK, so it's kind of hard to say I was duped, I was left off. And plus, Florida State never won a national championship before joining the Atlantic Coast Conference. Now they have three. So it seems like they have benefited from it. Were there timing issues with these conferences? Sure. But it would seem like to me, again, just the son of attorney, not an attorney like you, <laughs> that 
And, and sometimes we're, we're the most learned legal minds out there. But it was seemed to me that any self-respecting judge, you know, looking at, you know, law would say, just because you don't like the result of the contract you signed doesn't mean that you can cry foul and pull a seminal. And, and that's about to become a verb. To seminal means to complain, 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 get politicians involved just because I don't like the way it came out. I, I, am I missing something? I mean, that no. seems to be fairly I'll easy. I'll tell you what, man. I, I'm going to follow up on two things. Number one, I, I think this is a really important illustration that will help fans understand the Florida state lawsuit moving forward. When you hear bad faith or fiduciary mismanagement, a lot of people, a good way to think of it is you hire your financial advisor who makes recommendations about how to spread your portfolio out, maybe helps you pick specific stocks or mutual funds, et cetera. And of course, you have the ultimate decision with your financial advisor. You could say, no, I don't want that, or, or I want more of that or less of that. But, but ultimately, you either follow their lead or tell them what to do, right? But a fan whose, let's say, portfolio dramatically goes down in value, if you file a lawsuit and sue your financial advisor and your legal argument is stuff went sideways, things went wrong, he guessed inappropriately, he picked the wrong stocks, she liked the wrong mutual funds, if those things are the basis of the lawsuit and there's no more facts beyond stuff went sideways, you will lose. Not you might lose, you will lose. Similarly, Florida State simply saying, hey, as it turns out, that TV deal we signed back in 2013 slash 2016, it turned out to be below market value. And all these other leagues later negotiated much bigger deals reflecting the way the market went. And we should have been smarter about that. If all you're saying is things went poorly, <laughs> you lose. And I bring it back to the fan example because they can identify with and see with clarity their relationship with your financial advisor. Now, if beyond stuff went wrong, again, that's a bad legal argument. You ain't going to win by saying I lost money unless there's more facts. If you lost money and there was some kind of fraud by your financial advisor, now you might have a winning lawsuit. If there was reckless, outrageous behavior by your financial advisor and you lost money as a result, you may have a winning lawsuit. You do have to prove those things. You can't just say that you think they happened. You have to have evidence that this extreme, outrageous behavior took place or these fraudulent statements were made. You need evidence to prove that. Simply going forward with your financial advisor and your portfolio lost money, trust me, I mean, you could hire an attorney and lose your own money to hear the same advice. You'll lose the lawsuit. You can always file a lawsuit. I'm telling you, if the only evidence you have and you file a lawsuit against your financial advisor after your portfolio goes down, if the only evidence you have is that they picked the wrong stocks, you lose and you <laughs> wasted your money on a lawsuit. Same with Florida State. If the only evidence you have is, man, these other leagues gradually saw the market more accurately and signed better deals. If that's all you got, you lose. So keep that in mind. Also, the legal term bad faith is very hard to prove. You can be massively incompetent. You can trip over yourself. You can be the, the, the college sports equivalent of the three stooges and make all sorts of bad decisions while bumping into each other. You can be wrong a hundred times in a row with your judgment calls. Does not, does not automatically mean you acted in bad faith. Bad faith is way more than you're an idiot or stuff went wrong or you you ended up looking like a buffoon with that. That's not bad faith. Bad faith is way harder to prove than stuff went wrong. You don't win a lawsuit just because things out turned out poorly in your eyes or just because your league didn't make as much money as another league. So please, folks, keep those principles in mind. Otherwise, you're going to be completely clueless as this stuff unfolds. Finally, to your other point, Mike, Florida State signed the grant of rights willingly and repeatedly with the advice of experts and professionals. This is not a big corporation 
taking advantage of the little guy by tricking them. This is not taking advantage of somebody who can't read and tricking them with the fine print. These are big boys and girls, and they're fully capable of hiring and retaining quality advisors and attorneys who read the grant of rights, who, which is not a long legal document, or read the deal with ESPN, which is more complicated. You don't win a lawsuit because things didn't turn out the, hope, the way you hoped they would. You were an active participant, Florida State, in those decisions, just like those other schools. Your presidents had a voice in the room. Your athletic directors had a voice in the room. You had the same voting rights as everybody else. And if you didn't like the terms, you shouldn't have signed in 2013 and again in 2016 and again in other contexts. By the way, one more defense the ACC will have, and this might sound strange because you're almost insulting yourself as a league as you make this legal argument, but it could come to this. The value of the Atlantic Coast Conference's media deals do, do in part reflect, of course, your negotiating skill. And Florida State is going to try to attack the ACC was incompetent and buffoonish and reckless, and, and that's where the f fiduciary mismanagement accusation comes in. But any honest person, and there will be experts in these lawsuits proving beyond a shadow of a doubt what I am about to tell you. In fact, I volunteer to be one of those experts on the witness stand. It is beyond any doubt I could prove it to a, a kindergartner or the Supreme Court of the United States. There is absolutely no doubt about the following statement. Overall, Atlantic Coast Conference fans do not watch football games in nearly as large numbers or as consistently large numbers as fans of the Big Ten or the Southeastern Conference. And the idea that somehow John Swafford, former ACC commissioner, was holding as many aces and kings and queens in his hand as the SEC commissioner or the Big Ten commissioner was holding in their hands as they negotiated with their TV partners is upside down, insane, provably wrong, ridiculous, or add any other adjective that you like. The ACC does not have as good a standing to negotiate with its TV partners, not for some magical negotiating wizardry, but because their fans don't watch football nearly as much as the fans of those other two leagues. I write about it at ncsportsnetwork.com. The proof is in the numbers. It's, it's incredibly obvious. And that's not John Swafford's fault. The, the fans simply don't watch. Florida State fans watch in big numbers. But the ESPN and other partners are negotiating with the ACC as a whole. And whereas basketball was just as important as football for TV purposes 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, that's no longer the case and hasn't been for some time. And as these deals have become more football-centric, some of these uh, athletic directors and commissioners will tell you that TV money for a league is more than 80% football, less than 20% all other sports combined. So, I mean, let's just say 80% football, 19% men's basketball, that leaves 1% for all other sports combined. So men's basketball still matters. Other things matter some. Football matters the most. And when any ACC commissioner – if you or I or some fan watching or listening right now were the ACC commissioner, they simply could not have, would not have negotiated the same kind of deals that the, AC, the SEC or Big Ten commissioners could and did negotiate. Why? Not because, of again, of negotiating wizardry. Can that tweak a deal up a little bit? Sure. I mean, there's, a, there's an art to negotiation. But you're not taking a middling football TV numbers of viewers and turning it into the Big Ten and the SEC and tricking e your ESPN negotiating partners. just doesn't work that way. Even if the ACC did miscalculate a little bit, did misread the market, and did end up with a below-market deal, which I would say it did, that's not enough for a successful lawsuit. You need those other things on top of stuff went wrong to win an argument about bad faith or you know fiduciary mismanagement. Since... July 1st, 2023, do you know anybody in college athletics who's had a more bizarre timeline than Jim Phillips? I mean, Jim Phillips has Ooh. moved the ACC from Greensboro to Charlotte. He's dealt with Florida State making noise uh, about, 
you know, conference relocation and then the demise of one of the conferences in his alliance with the then Pac-12 and the Big 12. He's gone through the issues at Northwestern where he used to be the director of athletics where Pat Fitzgerald was let go and still some big lawsuits uh, coming right there. And now he's filing a lawsuit against one of his member institutions who, by the way, a month ago was left out of the college football playoff, which was chaired by a member of his AD cadre in Boo Corrigan of NC State. Now, Boo Corrigan had nothing to do with Florida State being left out, but it's a popular narrative out there. That, that, that's just some of those random things that you look at. But, man, Jim Phillips, right now, I've known Jim for 20 years. You've known him a long time. This is a really smart guy. And, uh, and it's you know, a hard he, time. He, it's, he it's a hard time. And I know we got to wrap Ooh. this up because because everybody's uh, awaiting our uh, <laughs> post on our website at ncsportsnetwork.com and our YouTube channel. Uh, meanwhile, my, my dog Oliver is, is biting at my heels and you and I both have other holiday commitments. We do, we still do have families, right? Um, but I'll, I'll add to your list briefly. Jim Phillips went through all the things that you just listed that I will not repeat during the same time, the most chaotic time in the history of college athletics with the formation of the transfer portal five years ago. And then more importantly, immediate eligibility for almost all transfers, which opened those floodgates. On top of that, name, image, likeness money. So you have those administrative questions, those conference questions, those TV questions, the, the Northwestern lawsuit, the, the moving of the ACC headquarters and everything else you mentioned happening at the same time. There has been more massive revolutionary change in major college sports in the last handful of years as there were in the previous 30 years. And I've been at this for 37 years now. So all the, that chaos in Jim Phillips' world happened at the same time that the world was already spinning at an, a, an unprecedented pace. And uh, I don't envy his place in this world. I think he gets more blame than he deserves. I do think he's made some mistakes and, and allowed Florida State to, to criticize him for not going to bat for them the way they wanted to see. Who knows? Probably would not have changed anybody's mind. But in, in today's world, the optics matter. And whether you or I think he did enough or he thinks he did enough, the people who matter at Florida State don't think he did enough. And as we started this conversation, um, that, that was not the biggest factor here. We all have to be real, right? Getting left out of the college football playoff was another straw in the camel's back. Florida State perceiving Jim Phillips as not being there for them at their time of need leading up to that decision about the playoff was another straw on the camel's back. But the, the, the growing financial gap of the ACC behind those two mighty leagues, that's about a thousand thralls, uh, straws on the camel's back. And it's just these last couple that maybe have broken that back. One last question before we let you go, and this is something that's out there and about, and people seem to be up in arms over the fact that Florida State and their attorneys and everybody and their attorneys haven't been able to get a copy of the grant of rights. That is kept in a vault, a secure location at the ACC offices now in Uptown Charlotte. I know from being on the Big East Television Committee and being a special counsel to our athletic director, also being on the CAA Television Committee, that that's usually an ESPN thing. That's their trade secrets and things like that as much as it is a conference requesting that that type of uh, exclusivity in terms of access to the document be there. Is there anything you could add to that that can help people understand why that document is so secure and you can only visualize it? You can't make copies of it or copy down parts of that to use even with your legal team. I don't know the full answer to that, so I'm not going to dive too deep into this one, but I can tell you that I have a copy of the, um, the 2016 amendment to the grant of rights. I, I have a PDF copy. <laughs> if I was more coordinated technologically, Mike, I would, I would share my screen right now <laughs> because I could pull up the PDF just of the amendment. The amendment in 2016 has basically one page of terms and then a bunch more pages where it's just different officials from different schools signing. I mean, that's how simple the amendment is, literally one page. In terms of the bigger document, I was kind of surprised some of the FSU lawyers talked about finding 
finding much of the information online, but not finding in FSU's possession uh, the original document for 2013 or maybe some other document. I wasn't exactly sure what they were referring to there, but I don't I don't think there's any mystery to that. The ACC is not going to hide from Florida State the, the, the terms of the grant of rights because, of course, those terms are going to be front and center as these lawsuits proceed. That's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell. We're following the ACC and their various challenges right now, most recently with Florida State University and lawsuits filed on Friday in Tallahassee and then also in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina on Thursday by the ACC against Florida State. We'll continue to follow this story all throughout the holidays. Check out our website, ncsportsnetwork.com and also follow us on the web at all of our social addresses at the NC Sports Net. For David Glenn, I'm Mike Waddell. We'll talk to you down the line right here all across the Old North State on the North Carolina Sports Network.